So, uh, thanks everyone. I want to thank uh, Dr. Uh, Langer for uh, the invitation to speak to everyone. Uh, I understand there's 1,800 people, which uh, made me a little more nervous than uh, uh, I wanted to be. But um, so my name is Dr. Michael Kim. I'm the director of the cardiac cath lab at Lenox Hill Hospital here in New York City. Uh, so what we do, uh, cardiac catheterization, is essentially we do pictures of the heart, uh, a combination of uh, coronary arteries themselves, uh, and I'll show you some examples. Uh, we also take pictures of bigger structures like the aorta and the, and the ventricles. Um, but the bottom line is we, we're able to, to actually get an incredible amount of data, both pressure, anatomic, and therapeutics, whether we put in a stent uh, to fix things, um, uh, which again, I'll show you all examples of, but through a very small incisions. Uh, and, and so that's what we do with uh, catheterization. And, and I want, so basically, uh, as with many major advances in life, uh, there's usually a combination of risk and luck. Uh, and so uh, similar to the story of cardiac cath, um, I'm, and, and what's in front of you is the first picture, and it's an x-ray of the first uh, human catheterization. And this was uh, Dr. Werner Forsman, who's a 24-year-old gentleman in Berlin who uh, wanted, his dream honestly was to uh, essentially advance a catheter or a small tube into the heart and, and show that you could do that safely. Uh, and what he did is, like, like a lot of pioneers, he did it on himself. Okay, so a lot of people will not allow you to do it. They think it's too unsafe, uh, but True pioneers, many of them, I'm not saying you should do this, but uh, you have to push the limits. And he opted to, to, to show the world that it's safe to do so. And he did this on his left antecubital arm here. Okay, so he, he advanced the catheter. Uh, this is the uh, superior vena cava, and this is the right atrium. And then he walked over to an x ray and said, Take a picture. And sure enough, there is the first human cardiac cath. This was done by a 24-year-old, okay? Not much older than you guys who are on the uh, screen now. So uh, again, you know, uh, sometimes you just have to push the envelope to really advance the field. Uh, and and this, this was one example. And this is the first human cardiac cath. Uh, they had done it in animals, horses, et cetera, but he wanted to show you could do it safely in a human. So that, that was, yeah. so that was, um, uh, the cath. Now, now going to the coronary, Andrew, I, I want to show you an example of just both uh, risk and luck. So this, the first coronary angiogram was done in 1958 at the Cleveland Clinic, which is a, a, a top rated hospital for, for coronary disease uh, for the last, you know, 50 so years. And part of the reason why is that uh, Dr. Mason Soans, who's a radiologist, uh, did the first human coronary angiograms where we injected dye into a coronary artery, uh, basically, which is now, you know, the basis of my entire career. Um, and so uh, what he did is he was just essentially uh, giving dye in the, in the aorta, which is known to be safe. Um, and so accidentally, as he was injecting dye in the aorta, uh, the, the catheter went into the coronary artery, the right coronary artery here. Uh, and, and as he was injecting dye, it just continued to inject dye. And he filled the right coronary artery and showed it right here, as you, as you see here. So this is the actual picture of Dr. Soans' uh, accidental right coronary angiogram in Cleveland Clinic in 1958. And everyone thought this patient would fibrillate. Um, at that point, you just have to do a human massage. There was no defibrillator. Uh, but in fact, the patient from this dye just became very bradycardic and almost asystolic, which means that uh, in, instead of a fast heart rate, it was an extremely slow heart rate. Uh, you could just sort of counteract that by coughing. Uh, and so he told the patient to cough, 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 uh, pulled out the catheter, and sure enough, the patient did fine. And he said, wow, you could actually uh, inject dye directly into the coronary arteries uh, without any real major issue. And so that was the first coronary angiogram, uh, which again uh, was done uh, with some risk, but uh, a, a lot of this was just pure luck. Right? And, and again, I think that, that happens a lot of time in many fields. 
uh, where you, it, again, it's risk and luck. And uh, you know, I, 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 I implore you guys uh, always to be, um, uh, as you say, you know, preparation, there is almost no real luck in life. Uh, the, the, usually the, the ones who are most prepared are the luckiest quote unquote. Uh, and so, you know, although he was lucky with injecting, he knew how to handle the situation uh, but because again, he was very well prepared about what to do when patients get bradycardic, et cetera. Uh, if the patient had died, they would say that you can't do this. Um, and we would probably never have gone forward with cardiac catheterization. So moving forward, I want to now just go to my talk. Uh, I'm just going to go over the, some of the basics of coronary anatomy, which, what, which is what I do, show you some examples. I'm more than happy to take questions at the end. So uh, how do you read a coronary angiogram? So a couple of things, well, I'll, I'll, uh, I'm gonna uh, give you some examples. If the spine is on the left side of the screen, you are RAO, meaning right anterior oblique and vice versa. Um, if you're using a femoral angiogram, you use the catheter and the descending aorta instead of the spine. Uh, the diaphragm is low on the film, you're caudal, meaning uh, the camera's uh, towards the foot of the patient. If it's high on the film, you're cranial, meaning that you're your, your camera's high towards the patient's head. And don't confuse a heart border with the diaphragm. So uh, I'm gonna give you, again, sh show you examples of how we read these angiograms. The caudal views show the left circumflex well, the cranial views show the LAD and what we call the right posterior descending artery well. Uh, again, some more an anatomy, the right coronary artery and the left circumflex run in the uh, AV groove, which is atrioventricular groove that really shows the difference between the atria and the ventricle and the left anterior descending and the posterior descending are running the interventricular groove, basically between the left and right ventricles. Uh, the LAO shots distinguish the left from right well, and the RAO shots separate the anterior from posterior. And again, I'll show you all examples. And this is, again, the coronary nomenclature we're gonna see. This is the right coronary that Dr. Sohn's injected. This feeds the inferior wall of the heart. Uh, basically, it's, it's split up between the proximal right coronary which is the beginning of the artery towards the first uh, right ventricular marginal, the mid right coronary and the distal coronary. And then at that point, it splits into a right posterior lateral and a right uh, posterior descending artery, which feeds the bottom of the heart. Then you have to move to a different catheter uh, to the other side of the aorta to inject the left coronary system. And this is the left main, as you see here, this is the most important few millimeters of artery in your heart because if you have a blockage here or a clot, you knock off both of these major branches. And the first one is the left anterior descending, which has both septals and diagonals, and then the left circumflex. And this feeds this uh, lateral or side of the heart. Uh, and this is in the atrioventricular groove, meaning the ventricles on this side, the atria is on this side of this line. And it, it has a couple branches called the obtuse marginals. And I'll show you all examples of that. So this is the uh, nomenclature of the coronaries. I'm gonna show you, here's a example. So this is what we call the spider view or the left anterior, uh, the left anterior uh, uh, oblique, uh, which shows you the distal left main proximal LED and left circumflex well. How do you play this again, Alex? Hmm? Yeah. Um, so again, here you go. You shoot die, this is the left main, this is the left circumflex that you mentioned, and this is the left anterior descending. So this view really shows uh, the left main well and the proximal LAD and left circumflex well. So that's why we always start with this view when we do a real coronary angiogram. This is the catheter, okay? This is coming through the leg. Most of the time we come through the wrist now, but uh, it goes up the aorta, around the aorta, this is the aortic valve right here, this little two bulbs here. And this is the left coronary artery, again, feeds the left anterior descending and the left circumflex, and those are your diagonals. Okay, now we move to, uh, we move the camera to the right instead of the left. How do I know this? The spine's now on the left side of the screen instead of the right side of the screen. This is a caudal view. Uh, how do I know this? Because the diaphragm is below here, okay? It's not up, this is the heart border right here. That's the lung. This is the actual left ventricle. This is the left atria. And again, the diaphragm's down below. This 
uh, it, this caudal view, as I told you, really shows the left circumflex well. And that's this view here of this big artery right here. And that feeds the lateral wall of the heart. Okay, so left main if you, splits again into the left anterior descending and the left circumflex. These are small obtuse marginal branches. This feeds the side of the heart. The left anterior descending feeds the front of the heart, which is the, the most important. So now I move to a cranial view. How do I know this? That now the diaphragm is right in front of us. It's moving up and down as you breathe. Okay. So that's great for, as I mentioned before, it's great for the LAD. And again, this is us injecting dye and it feeds the, the main artery in front of you, which is the left anterior descending. Those are some septals and that's a diagonal branch. And as you see here, there's, there's some mild, moderate disease in the LAD, right sort of here. Um, nothing crazy, uh, but it's not normal. Uh, you see that it's a little bigger distally. It's right here, there's some stenosis, some lumpy buppy disease in the more proximal end. Uh, and again, you could figure this out all with coronary angiography. And this is all, again, because a combination of Dr. Forsman uh, basically putting a catheter in his antecubital and Dr. Soans, who accidentally injected that right coronary, and he was able to successfully manage that complication well, uh, which allowed us to continue to move forward and do this safely. So again, this cranial shows the LED very well. This is an AP cranial. Why do I know that? Because the catheter is right in the middle of the screen. Again, the cranial show the LED very well, and that's this sort of long diffuse artery here. That's a big diagonal up here. Again, some moderate disease in the proximal and mid portion of that left anterior descending. Now we moved LAO. How do I know that? Because the catheter now is on the right side of the screen instead of the left or in, in the middle. Uh, and, and again, it's very good for showing the left anterior descending and these diagonal branches. Again, left main, that's a big circ up here left anterior descending here. This is all done. Uh, it takes like a few seconds to take these pictures. Uh, taking uh, a full diagnostic set of right and coronary shots takes no more than five to 10 minutes. Um, now I will say a lot of people uh, get confused about what's the circumflex and what's the LED. Uh, one way you could really tell the difference is is uh, no matter what view you're in, if you identify the septal perforators, they come off 90 degrees from the LED, always perpendicular from the LED. And, and that's the only sort of branch that comes off perpendicular to a major artery. Uh, and once you've figured that out, then you've I always identified the LED and the other big vessel there is the left circumflex. Okay, so I'm gonna show you, just to give an example again, so here's a cranial, and those are these steps right here, these, these tiny little branches that look like the little branches of a tree, arborization we call it, uh, come off 90 degrees off this major vessel here. So those are this, once you re recognize that those little branches, you know that must be the LED, which means the other vessel must be the circumflex. So, for, for the amateurs out there, that's, that's the best way to determine uh, what vessel is what, because a lot of times people will not know if you're cranial or caudal, uh, LAO, REO, but if you always identify these septals, you will know that that comes off the LAD. Similar again, these little septals right here. Okay, now we move to a different catheter. Uh, this is now the right coronary uh, catheter, and then we shoot the right coronary artery. So I mentioned the left uh, shows the left main and LAD. Then we move and get a smaller catheter, smaller tip, and we inject and shoot the right coronary as you see here. This is the same artery Dr. Soans had injected. Uh, this feeds the bottom of the heart, which is only about 15 to 20 percent of the uh, performance of the left ventricle. As you see here, it looks like the letter C. It always looks like the letter C. Um, and there's really no significant disease here just some lumpy bumpy stuff. But this patient has 
what we call non-obstructive coronary artery disease, meaning we don't expect anything here to explain any symptoms of angi angina, uh, which is uh, chest pressure, or sometimes people present with shortness of breath, uh, which is just a manif manifestation of oxygen supply demand mismatch. So as you can imagine, um, your heart needs oxygen. It needs it more at times of stress. For example, when you exercise or if your blood pressure goes up for whatever reason, fight or flight, um, you need more oxygen to feed the muscle. And uh, if you have a significant blockage anywhere, let's say a 95% blockage here, uh, with that dema extra demand, your supply is limited, okay? It may be enough at baseline where you're just sort of relaxed, sitting down, blood pressure's okay, your heart rate's okay. Um, but again, with increased demand, uh, let's say you start walking up a hill or running up a hill, your, your body needs more oxygen. If you have a fixed 95% blockage anywhere, your supply is limited. And so then you'll become a little ischemic or your, your muscle will not receive enough oxygen from this artery and you could then develop chest pain, okay? And the chest pain is, just means your muscle in your heart uh, is not receiving enough oxygen, usually from a blockage in one of these epicardial arteries, uh, which cannot deliver that blood, uh, oxygenated blood to that muscle in that time of increased demand. So we went a little more cranial here uh, in the right coronary, and that just helps, again, to open up the right posterior descending artery, which is in the same plane as the left anterior descending, just on the back of the heart instead of the front of the heart. And so this is, again, the right coronary, comes, looks like the letter C, and then feeds the bottom of the left ventricle here, okay? This is an REO shot. How do I know this? Again, the catheter and the spine are on the left side of the screen. This is very good to show the mid right coronary uh, and any collaterals to the LAD, which I'll show you an example of that. Again, shows the right posterior descending, which feeds the bottom of the heart. The heart is right here. You can sort of see the shadow contracting and this vessel's on the bottom of it. The front of the heart is up here. This is where the LAD would be. And this is a ventriculogram. So then what we do is we put a catheter, as, as you see here, it's going up it's going up the spine. This is the aorta. We cross the aorta. We put a pigtail catheter, which allows us to inject a lot of dye. Uh, and then we could opacify the left ventricle here, okay? And the left ventricle is what uh, really gives oxygen to the body. So if you can imagine here that this is the blood and it, it, the heart ejects that blood into the aorta, okay, up here. And from there, it injects it to your brain, to your kidneys, to your lungs, um, uh, to, you know, to blood vessels in your feet. And that's really uh, what uh, oxygenates your whole body and gives it function. So you can imagine when, when someone has what, what we call heart failure and the heart cannot pump well, let's say from a heart attack, basically all those organs don't receive enough, enough blood because the pump is poor. Uh, and that's when you can become, have renal failure, uh, blood can be backed up into the lungs because it, uh, it, again, the heart cannot push it forward, it backs up. Uh, and, you know, if your blood pressure winds up being very low because of it, then you become dizzy, et cetera. Um, develop fluid in your lungs and your feet. Uh, and that's again, signs of chronic heart failure from a weak pump. So this again shows the left ventricle, this is, an, this is an REO view, which I mentioned is very good at differentiating anterior from posterior. Okay, so this is the front of the heart where the LED presides. This is the back of the heart, the uh, posterior wall of the heart where the right posterior descending artery resides. So if you happen to have uh, a heart attack in the LED, you'll see that this portion of the heart does not move. If you had one in the uh, right coronary, uh, this portion here would not move. Uh, again, this all gives you clues as to territory of blockages, et cetera. So this person has a very robust ejection fraction, no damage to the heart. All the walls of the heart are uh, contracting beautifully, okay? 
This also shows if you have a leaky mitral valve. So right here is your mitral valve, okay? So if in fact we injected dye and there was a lot of blood going over here in the left atrium, we would know that your valve is leaky. Uh, usually nowadays we just learn, we do that from echocardiography or, or an ultrasound, but uh, we could do this quite well with, uh, again, this ventriculogram uh, through ca cardiac catheterization. This is a, a left anterior oblique. We generally never really do this uh, shot except uh, for patients who might have had a left circumflex. And I said the circumflex feeds the, the lateral wall of the heart. And uh, really uh, what that shows here well is this is the lateral wall in LAO. You can't really see the lateral wall in REO very well. But if in fact you saw uh, a circumflex uh, myocardial infarction, you might want to do that view just to show if the lateral wall not moving well. And again, be on the right side of the screen here. Okay, so this is again, uh, just uh, some real life examples. This is obviously uh, the right coronary artery, looks like the letter C. There's a right posterior descending artery here, a lot of calcium. Um, and in better view, here's an example of of uh, basically some coronary artery disease that could cause uh, chest pain. So this is the right coronary, this is the right posterior descending. As you see here, right there, there's stenosis, okay? The, you see it narrows down significantly right there and over here. This, act, this patient actually had a stent before. I don't know if you could see it well enough, but there's a stent from here to here. And so this is what we consider uh, what we call instant restenosis, uh, a process where the stent closes back down from smooth muscle cell proliferation. Um, it happens much less frequently now with these drug coated stents. We now coat the stents uh, with a chemotherapeutic drug that prevents small, smooth muscle cell proliferation. Uh, with the old non drug coated stents, this would uh, restenose probably about 35% of the time. Uh, with these new drug coated stents, which uh, came out in 2004, uh, now we it restenoses maybe less than 5% of the time. So they're much more durable uh, long term. But again, this is an example of obstructive coronary artery disease, where uh, where you might have to then again put a put a balloon or a new stent inside this old stent to 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 uh, reestablish uh, normal blood flow. That is right there. Okay. This is the right uh, REO view of that, as you see here. Again, stenosis there. Moving on, we move to the left side. Uh, this is we change catheters. Again, this is the spider view, LAO caudal, where we we see the left main, left circumflex, left anterior descending up here. There's no disease in the left main or proximal left circumflex or proximal LAD here. This is an REO caudal. Okay, the catheter is the spines on the left side of the screen. Left circumflex here, beautiful, really no significant disease. Here's the LAD up here, big diagonal. You can see right here, there's a little bite there. There's some moderate disease in the proximal LAD right there. We'll, we'll, we'll go to a cranial view to look at that a little better. Cranial view here. Okay, this is actually a pretty interesting. This patient, this patient has an old stent. You can, I don't know if you can see it right here. An old stent in the diagonal, which looks patent right there because there's an old stent here. This is the patient's LED here, okay? And this patient actually has what something we call a myocardial bridge. Um, Right here, the mid, right there, you can see the, the mid LED is being squeezed by the muscle of the heart. Okay, so that's not normal right there. It's sort of, you can see the, the, the heart, the muscle or the artery being squeezed right there with each systolic beat. Every time the heart contracts, um, it squeezes the, the LED. Usually the LED circumflex RCA is on top of the muscle, and so it never happens, but I would say about five to 10% of the people have what we call a bridge where it, it goes into the muscle. And as, as you get older, your heart muscle becomes 
uh, less compliant, and you start uh, actually squeezing this vessel more. There's really nothing you can do about it. Try to uh, give medications to have the heart muscle squeeze a little less, uh, but really you can't put a stent in there. It usually uh, always restenosis. Sometimes people will actually bypass it for very severe cases of angina from that bridge, but usually you just leave it alone. This is another view of that right there. Big myocardial bridge, what we call. Here's an old stent, looks fine. Doing well there. One more view, LAO cranial. Again, showing that bridge. Left circumflex here. Those are those big septals I mentioned that come off the LAD. And then this is again, the ventriculogram. This is the aorta. This is the aortic valve we cross. This is the anterior wall of the heart, posterior wall of the heart. This is a very vigorous uh, uh, ejection fracture. So if anything, it's almost contracting too hard, uh, which causes its own symptoms, but clearly no damage to the heart whatsoever because every piece or every uh, part of the, the, the left ventricle here is contracting very well. So I just want to go over a couple historical collaterals. Collaterals means that you have a, 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 a complete occlusion and your body has formed its own bypass. Um, and so there's two sort of very famous collaterals. One's called the circle of Eusians, which is a conus to proxo LAD uh, occlusion. And then a Kugel, which is a right to right collateral from basically the RCA feeds itself to, uh, to collateralize or bypass its own 100% uh, blockage. So here, here is uh, the left left system. As you see right here, is a, there's an abrupt cutoff. That's a occluded left anterior descending proximal LAD. It usually comes up and around. The circumflex looks fine. Again, here's the LAD. It's gone. You see that? It's just gone right here. It should be coming around here. Here, sort of, it sort of fills itself later. But right there, there's a acute cutoff. So what feeds that? Actually, the circle of use, there is, there's the remainder of the vessel. That's the remainder of the LAD. And that is fed from this Kugel collateral here. This right coronary comes up and feeds this uh, remainder of the mid and distal LAD. That's called the circle of, here's, here it is again, you see that? This is the remainder of the LAD here that's being collateralized or bypassed by the right coronary, okay? Um, just showing, uh, this is how the heart sort of uh, heals itself. It prevents you from having a large heart attack because, uh, um, again, if, if, if there was no flow to this LAD, you would have a massive heart attack. So this patient obviously had a very slow, slowly progressing occlusion where the uh, proximal LAD was 50% blocked, then 60% blocked, then 70% blocked. And eventually, once around 90, 95%, uh, your body will start forming its own bypass uh, to protect itself from a heart attack. Uh, and essentially, this is an example of that. Now, if you have a heart attack where people just drop dead, what happens is that it was not an acute or quick occlusion. Uh, excuse me, it wasn't a, a, a very prolonged occlusion, gradual occlusion. It was a very acute, quick occlusion where a blockage was like 40, 50%. And then what happened is that the plaque ruptured, we call it a plaque rupture. Um, it just sort of broke off and formed a blood clot on it. And once that happens acutely, you know, a patient's doing well and all of a sudden uh, you get a, a quick clot in your heart artery. And then you'll, you, this is the sort of the classic clutching of the chest by someone who then might go into an arrhythmia um, because of that acute occlusion and then just, you know, sort of drop dead. Um, or someone who just falls asleep at night, doesn't wake up. A lot of times it is from something uh, where the uh, occlusion is acute. It just sort of happens abruptly. This is a cubal collateral. This is where a conus, the right actually fills itself um, from a occlusion here. Uh, essentially this sinus nodal branch will then connect to this AV nodal branch and uh, fill itself right to right. And here's an example there. See this? This collateral fills the bottom of the heart. Here's another view of it. It feeds the, the distal part of the heart from 
a branch off the um, a branch off the uh, proximal portion, which is the sinoatrial node. I'm going to quickly do it here on the left. It shows a little better on the left. Okay, here we go. So this branch right here will come up, go through the intraatrial septum, and then connect to the AV nodal artery, which is down at the end of the artery to fill the, the basically the, the end of the artery through a branch off the beginning of the artery. And there's the end of the right coronary. So it, again, this, that's a cugal collateral. All right, so we went over a circle of eucins, which is a conus to prox LED collateral, and this is a right-to-right -right cugal collateral. So those are the basics of uh, coronary uh, anatomy, and that's what we do, uh, basically how to how we diagnose coronary disease. Um, at this point, I'm more than happy to take any questions. If not, I'll show uh, a couple real life examples. It's up to you what you want to do here. I can open the chat up for questions or you can show something else. Uh, yeah, let's, let's open up first for any questions. And right. then I'll... Can you see the chat? Do you want to... Uh, let's see. I cannot see this chat. You might want to let me stop your sharing for a sec. That might help. Do you see the chat function at the bottom? Yep, hit it. Yep. Okay, great. All right. Um, okay, a lot of weird chats here. Um, Just scroll down to 1133 is when. Okay. Related. Okay, when getting coronary disease, this plaque obstruction is from one side of the heart or both sides, or does it depend on this form on one side of the heart? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. Uh, usually, um, uh, it, I think for in a chronic situation, uh, not in a heart attack situation, usually it forms uh, just initially on one, okay, one artery. Um, now, if you have a lot of if you have a lot of risk factors like you're diabetic, you're a smoker, you have strong family history, basically you'll many of those patients will develop what we call multivessel coronary disease, where it essentially could uh, uh, affect all three major arteries, multiple branches, and that's usually more so in diabetics and in smokers uh, and patients with uh, strong family history of early coronary artery disease. Um, now, when you have a heart attack, again, usually there's just one area that could be, uh, it's usually the LED or right coronary circumflex heart attacks are less, are less common for whatever reason, um, but it does inflame the blood uh, systemically. So usually, sometimes about 20% of the times you'll have mul what we call multiple culprit arteries in a heart attack, where essentially you, you develop one, it ruptures, uh, the body becomes very inflamed, the blood becomes inflamed, and then it'll rupture, that inflamed blood will rupture another plaque, uh, you know, either usually a, 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 in a different artery, uh, usually not in the same artery. Uh, but again, that, that could happen up to like 20% of times where you have multiple culprit arteries in a, uh, in, a, in a heart attack. So are there common injuries to the heart veins associated with being an athlete? Um, so that's not my my field, but you know, uh, usually it's not an issue with uh, a blockage to an artery. Uh, you know, the big thing with ath athletes are, are there is there is a risk of something we call um, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, where uh, young athletes um, may, as they exert themselves, for, uh, basically go into a, usually ventricular fibrillation uh, or a very dangerous rhythm, and that is usually from a, a condition called uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, where it's, and again, it's, it's congenital, autosomal dominant, but uh, essentially you, you have too much muscle in the septum of the heart. Uh, so you have a very thick heart in the septum and can prevent uh, uh, normal blood flow out into the aorta. And more importantly, it could cause these dangerous arrhythmias when, when you exert yourself. And usually it doesn't happen you know, when you're uh, a high school athlete, it really sort of really manifests itself more so in college years and then 
in young adulthood. And, and, and you, you always see, you know, these athletes who are on the field and all of a sudden they, you know, they, they drop. Uh, and, met, and many times once that happens, they, it's very hard to resuscitate them. Uh, they go into what we call refractory ventricular arrhythmias. And that's why we're so, uh, you know, basically we're, we're, we're very cognizant of that condition. Okay, let's move on. Okay, how do symptoms of coronary artery disease show up differently in men and women? So another great question. So um, there is a whole arena of women's heart disease. They definitely present uh, a little differently. Women generally present 10 years later than men. Uh, it's thought that the estrogen uh, is protective, is cardioprotective. Uh, obviously, once you hit menopause, it usually takes about 10 years uh, of that effect to uh, go away. And at that point, uh, the risk is the same. But up to then, um, it does appear that um, uh, estrogen is cardioprotective. Uh, and so they definitely, there's much less coronary disease uh, initially early on in women versus men, but later, uh, again, it's, there's no difference in prevalence. Uh, how do they present differently? There is, seems to be more, less, what we call uh, less plaque rupture in women. Uh, and more intra intracoronary hemorrhage, so they actually seem to bleed around a plaque more often than than men do, versus um, just having a plaque that that sort of ruptures and then forms a clot. And and so you know, the, and, and the point of that is that uh, the way we traditionally treat heart attacks is with a lot of uh, medications that that make the blood less uh, sticky, uh, but the problem is that those medications can lead to more bleeding, as you can imagine. Uh, so um, we've noticed in women who, who undergo uh, angiography that they tend to bleed more. And it may be because, again, uh, that the, the plaque is, is filled with blood versus, uh, versus lipid. Um, and so uh, we're not exactly treating uh, that particular blockage, uh, ideally, uh, and, and, and the way we essentially, the doses of medications we give in women may be a little too much, you know, compared to men. Uh, and that, again, that's part of the issues with uh, cardiac research. If you look at most research in heart disease, uh, it's almost always these big trials of 50,000 people will be 75% men. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's, it's something that we can improve on, definitely more research in women and heart disease. It's become a very popular field. And I, I think, you know, in the future, uh, we'll, we'll learn more and more about the ideal way uh, to treat men and women. It, uh, sometimes it's the same way, other times it may be a little different. Um, okay. Okay. Do you want to talk a little bit about your path to medicine? Because people are usually very interested in that. Okay. Well, you know, I will say, you know, a couple things about uh, medicine. Um, uh, you know, I, I always tell my, my, my students the, the current time frame for medicine is always the best time. So uh, you always hear some of these some of the older docs will always say that there's too much paperwork that you know they they wouldn't do this again um you know they had more they had more autonomy back then but i will say that uh whenever you uh whenever you're able to uh start medicine whether it's it was 1980 or 2000 or 2020 or 2030 or 40 i will always say that is the best time to enter medicine and the reason why is that uh, no matter what you do with the insurance and whatnot and, and access, uh, those are all real issues, of course. But, um, but the bottom line is in terms of therapies, uh, whenever that current time period, there's more therapies at that present time than before. So you're, off, you're always able to offer better and more therapies to your patients uh, for any disease uh, whenever you start medicine uh, versus uh, people that started earlier. Um, and because of that, I think it's, it's always the best time to enter medicine, whenever the time is for you. Um, furthermore, I, you know, I, I, I'll tell you, so this whole 
uh, COVID-19 pandemic that's occurred in New York. Obviously, New York City was it was a, a major uh, epicenter of the epicenter, right? But uh, it was incredibly inspiring to see. So, you know, I'm an interventional cardiologist where I essentially just do this particular procedure over and over and over, uh, like ultra uh, focused. Um, but having said that, I saw all my colleagues, including myself, go back to the bedside. Uh, we went, you know, basically just to take care of patients the most basic way, which was to get a history and physical, to comfort them, uh, to, to talk to their family members, uh, and just, you know, just show them that we're here to help them out. And, and I saw 70-year-old colleagues, uh, you know, come back from retirement uh, to, to, you know, the floors, the ICUs, uh, and, you know, it was, it was incredible. And that's because physicians, ultimately, that is what we do. We take care of patients uh, during their most vulnerable time period, really, really. And, and you know, and for me, it's, it's really, you're given the privilege of doing that. Um, so, and it's not about saving lives. Sometimes we save lives. I think, you know, for example, when we, when we open a, 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 a blocked artery acutely from a heart attack, uh, we save lives, actually. But generally, it's just to make their life better in any sort of way, whether it's just uh, that they get less pain or, or that, you, that you're able to keep them alive for an extra two days so that their family members can come over and, and say goodbye to them. So really, you know, our, our job is just to uh, sort of alleviate suffering in any form. And, and, and again, I think this pandemic really showed uh, how uh, any physician is able to do that, whether an orthopedic surgeon, a uh, neurosurgeon, a cardiologist, uh, you know, that we all came together during this time really just to do the same thing, which was to take care of patients who are short of breath, uh, who uh, were scared. Um, and uh, there wasn't much we could offer them besides oxygen, but uh, really it was more that we, we just showed that, you know, that we're there with them, they're not alone. Uh, and really, uh, you know, that's, that's why we go into medicine. It'll never go away. No robot will ever be able to replace that feeling amongst human beings. Uh, you know, robots will replace a lot of things, but they will never replace a, a caring physician. Um, and that's why I think the field is, is more exciting than ever. Um, I will say that, you know, one pearl I would say is that you should always go into a field that you're good at, okay? And meaning don't, don't do something because you, you just want to do it, like you read about it, you know, uh, you think you, you want to do it because your uncle did it, uh, you know, your, your father or mother went to that field, uh, you saw it on Grey's Anatomy, you know, my daughter loves Grey's Anatomy, she wants to be a neurosurgeon, but she likes uh, Patrick Dempsey. Uh, and so, you know, but you can't do it based on something like that. What you do is you, I, I for example, thought I would be an orthopedic surgeon. I'm not sure why, you know, my dad told me that. Uh, but basically when I went through med school, uh, I realized that, geez, I liked coronary physiology. Like that's what was very, very interesting to me. Uh, at that point I decided I was gonna do cardiology. Uh, instead of orthopedic surgery, I was just better. At, and if, if you're more interested in something, you are, you read up on it more, uh, you, you don't forget sort of the, the, the minutia, and, and then you wind up doing well in that field because of real interest and not because you, you, you know, it's part of some life plan. Um, having, having said that, so then I went to molecular cardiology, I did a year, I got an NIH re, uh, research grant. I thought I wanted to do molecular cardiology. I, uh, having said that, you know, I wasn't very good at it because I, I actually, liked cardiac cath better. Uh, I did a very brutal eight month, I'm sorry, eight week uh, rotation where I had zero interest of going into it initially. But, uh, you know, just that's what I was uh, naturally good at. And you got a lot of good feedback because of that. Uh, and then uh, essentially I went into the field. I never thought I'd be an interventional cardiologist again, but I just went the route of where um, sort of natural interest slash inherent talent sort of takes you. 
And I would suggest you, everyone do that going forward uh, because uh, honestly, you're going to find your day-to-day -day life much more interesting if you're in a field that you actually like uh, versus uh, a field that you just sort of picked out, you know, uh, nilly, nilly dilly, um, uh, or because, again, because you wanted to take over your, your, your aunt's practice or your, your uncle's practice, you know, et cetera. So, uh, you know, those are some pearls I would say about uh, picking a field, uh, do it because uh, you're, you're, you're naturally interested in it. Um, for example, a lot of you might want to be a neurosurgeon. You actually go into, you read about it, you may dislike it. So, you know, don't continue saying I'm going to be a neurosurgeon because, you know, I have a family uh, filled with neurosurgeons because you're not going to like it. Um, you may, maybe you'll like interventional cardiology more, what, you know, I hope. But, uh, you know, th those are sort of my, my, my journey in medicine. And, uh, you know, I, I, I don't regret it for a day. Okay, so, so there's a lot of questions here. Um, yeah, just get what you can, just do what you can answer. There are a lot of people in the chat, so. Okay. So yeah, I went over what made me choose a cardiology. Uh, for CED or STA segment elevations always shown when studying e EKGs. So, you know, I, I will say, you know, EKGs are grossly overrated, okay? People love uh, getting EKGs. Uh, I think it's part of it's just, you know, like you see it on, on television. But the only time an EKG is very helpful is uh, when you're having an active heart attack, you will see ST segment elevation, which just means injury to the heart. Um, but if you're not, it usually is just a pretty boring, you know, six second strip of your life. Uh, if you're having an arrhythmia, it will show that maybe, uh, but people always, when they, when you go see a cardiologist in clinic, they, there's a couple things uh, they always want. One is a blood pressure check. One is they want the physician to listen to their heart and lung with a stethoscope. Uh, again, not very helpful, but what I always do it because otherwise the patient will think that you did not do a full exam and a good job on them. So I always listen, heart and lung, I check my own blood pressure. And then most, for most patients always want an EKG and always look like the last EKG. Uh, you know, they're having no chest pain, but it just uh, is something that they all like to get done. It's, it's all part of, you know, the art of medicine, I'll say. Uh, you know, there's, there's the science of medicine, and then there's the art of medicine. Uh, and again, part of the reason why um, robots will never uh, replace physicians, uh, because a robot will say, you do not need an EKG, it's useless, it's a waste, uh, and then next you know, the patient will never come back to you, uh, because you have to sort of know uh, what each patient uh, is worried about and what they want, and, and you have to sort of just go with the flow. So um, moving forward, what was like being a physician during the pandemic in NYC it was, it was exciting. It was exciting and hard. I do not want to do it again, but again, I thought it brought out the best in, in, in humanity, mostly amongst my colleagues, nurses, the respiratory, te respiratory techs were, were phenomenal. Uh, they put, I mean, it was, it was unbelievable how, how hard they worked, uh, put their lives on the line. Um, but it was tough. Okay, let's see. Um, thoughts on TPA compared to clot extraction? You know, I will say that heart attacks are like a stroke. Clearly, they're, they're the same. Uh, it's a acute clot in an artery that prevents uh, oxygen from reaching the tissue and then causes death. So generally, um, we also had a, an era where we just gave lytics to open coronary arteries. And actually, they're, they're pretty effective. We started doing it more so during uh, the uh, pandemic because there was such concern about not enough PPE in the cath lab. You, you know, you had to have like eight people to get it on. Um, 
to do the test, you needed, you know, eight N95s, you needed eight masks, eight, eight, eight gowns, and, and we were concerned that it was extremely uh, contagious, so we try to do more uh, lytics versus uh, angiography. I, I wouldn't necessarily agree with that anymore, but, um, you know, it, it is quite effective. It, it opens up the artery, I would say, about 60 to 70 percent of the time, uh, which is pretty good. Uh, the stent does it 95 percent of the time, but, uh, you know, it's still, again, pretty, pretty effective stuff. What is your thought on giving advanced pain meds like fentanyl morphine to chest pain? I mean, you, you don't want to mask chest pain for the most part, okay? Uh, because, you know, just by making the pain go away does not, <laughs> obviously if it's, it's from the locked artery, you could give them morphine, pain's gone, but guess what? You still have a blocked artery and it still means the, the muscle's not receiving enough oxygen. So you gotta be very careful about giving the pain meds. If, you, if I'm working on someone who uh, I want, I'm opening the artery and they're having a lot of pain, I will give them some fentanyl and morphine because I, I'm still gonna work on it. So it's not like I'm gonna uh, uh, avoid the, the cause of the pain. I'm gonna do it, but in the meantime, while they're having incredible amounts of pain, I will treat them for that. Uh, what is the hardest part of your job? Um, job is great. You know, uh, anyone who's interested in medicine, it is, I would say it's the, it's, it's, a, it's the greatest job. Uh, the hardest part of it, I would say, is it is, it, it is um, not a nine to five job. So, you know, you don't clock out at five and not worry about your patients and say, you know, if someone, they don't do well, call the, you know, whoever's covering from five until eight the next morning, you will always say, make sure you call me. Um, and so it, it's a 24 seven job. So I, I do think, you know, your family has to understand that. Uh, my wife is a physician, so she went through med school. It's, uh, you know, she's, she fully understands all that. Uh, but, you know, I, I know, you know, other colleagues who, who've had issues with that. Uh, so I do think that, you know, uh, any, you know, people around you have to know that your job is more important more so than, you know, than other jobs for the most part. Uh, and so, uh, you know, you have to sort of uh, work, do that work-life balance. Josh, I see you. That means uh, I'm, I'm done. Yep, it's 12 o'clock. Thank you so much for speaking, though. Okay, great. Uh, and again, good luck to everyone here. Um, and uh, I'm more than happy if anyone, you know, wants to direct uh, email me or, or, or ask questions, Josh, please uh, feel free to uh, give them my uh, info. Yep. If they reach out to me, I'll give them their right. info. Thank you so much, everybody, for coming. And we'll see you all tomorrow. Thanks.